In 1940, Walt Disney realized an enormous breakthrough in a one-of-a-kind fusion of animation, music, and theatrical presentation. It was called Fantasia. Fifty years later, Walt Disney's creative heirs assumed a daunting challenge to continue and build upon the combined inspirations of animation art and classical music originated in that now revered film. Fantasia was Walt Disney's most unusual, innovative, and personal film. A fusion of the art of the animated image and classical music conducted by the famed Leopold Stokowski, Fantasia was released in 1940. It was presented not as just a movie, but as an event, opening exclusively at a dozen specially equipped theaters, and was presented in the first stereophonic sound exhibition. The Disney team called it Fantasound. Although Fantasia would come to be regarded as one of the most unusual and influential films of the 20th century, the enormous expense of creating and releasing the film, combined with the confusion of critics and the indifference of audiences, defeated the ambitious experiment. For all its innovation, Walt Disney's most daring and personal motion picture creation was unappreciated in his lifetime. He was just devastated by it. I don't think he ever really got over it. He was always moving forward and never looking backward, but I think the one thing that he did look back at with great pain was Fantasia. At the time of its original release, Fantasia was intended to be a perpetual touring concert presentation, with new selections regularly replacing existing segments over years of continual release. Although the concept of a continuing Fantasia was abandoned in 1941, Disney had planted a seed that grew for decades. The idea of uniting music and visuals to create a unique entertainment. The idea of marrying the best music and the best animation art was so powerful that 40 years after Fantasia, it still resonated in the halls at the Disney studio. I can remember coming out in the early 80s and Mel Shaw was working on something called Musicana, which was world music put to wonderful graphics. And Mel was working on Sibelius's Finlandia. And Ken Anderson had been doing an American jazz piece. And he'd been working on an African piece. And there was Alibaba done with pigeons. And John Lasseter of Toy Story fame was doing The Emperor's Nightingale with Mickey Mouse. So this idea never went away. It was waiting for, what it was really waiting for was Roy E. Disney to say, yes, we will go this way. Roy is the, of course, the chairman of animation. But in real sense, he's the godfather of animation or the patron saint of animation. Roy Disney's the one who fought to make sure that animation stayed alive at Disney. And Roy has been extremely passionate about animation for such a long time. When the studio was taken over by Frank Wells and Michael Eisner in 1984, he was the man who said animation is the cornerstone of this company. I came back to the company in 1984 in rather cavalier way at the time said to Michael, why don't you let me have the animation department because I may be the only guy right now with all these new people coming in who at least understands the process and knows most of the people. The state of the art at that moment was kind of waning and the enthusiasm of the studio itself towards it had not been real strong. So I just felt a little protective about it for one thing. Never worked in it, I, was, I can't draw so I was always self-excluded. <laughs> in spite of his lack of drawing ability, Roy Disney's commitment to animation led to a renaissance in the art form. You could go down the list very quickly. The first 
animated film ever nominated for an Academy Award as Best Picture was Beauty and the Beast. The largest grossing animated film of all time was The Lion King. There were sensational successes with Little Mermaid and Aladdin. I mean, they came one right after the other. And on top of all of that, it was sort of the crest of the VHS wave, and so we were releasing home videos one after another. And Fantasia was all restored and came out on home video, sold 20 some odd million copies around the world, which is still an enormous number to this day. And it was such a gigantic success. This showed that the time was ready for a new Fantasia. I semi-facetiously wrote a note to Michael that said, look at this reservoir of goodwill for the movie and the idea of Fantasia that's out there worldwide. And we've made enough money off that video that we could actually afford to make a new Fantasia now, just off the profits. And interestingly, he agreed with that idea. And uh, that occurred in sort of mid-1991. The Walt Disney Studio is unique in Hollywood for many reasons, but the one that concerns me the most is a sense of continuity. We had to sort of gather ourselves together and look way back at the Snow Whites and Fantasias and Bambis and Dumbos and Pinocchios and say, look what we were capable of once and look at the levels we now have to try to rise to again. What could be more natural than reviving an idea of Walt's? To make Fantasia a, a showcase for unusual and forward-thinking ideas in animation. It's Walt's dream, but it didn't happen until Roy picked it up again. It scared people. It scared our artists. Could they, in fact, achieve something that would match the brilliance of the original Fantasia? And I f immediately formed a little unit uh, of about three of us. <laughs> began looking at the old movie and started making notes and thinking about, gee, if this is real, what would you do? You know, this is one of those things where you dream about it forever, and when somebody says, go ahead, you go, who, me? <laughs> you know. So, the time is now. And Roy said, we're going to go ahead and do Fantasia Continued. That's what it was called. As he studied the content and structure of the original Fantasia, Roy Disney also began the process of finding a suitable musical collaborator for Fantasia Continued. Clearly, Leopold Sarkowski was so important to Walt and the collaboration was so important to Walt, we had to find someone of equal stature who was collaborative and flexible about the use of classical music in the film format. We were looking for someone, for our own Stokowski, who was someone who would empathize with our need to maybe play around with the music a little bit and not use the full classic versions of, of long pieces, uh, and who had a sense of humor about that. The search for a musical colleague led Roy Disney to a meeting with maestro James Levine, whose nearly three-decade association with the Metropolitan Opera has earned him an honored place in the musical world. So Tom Schumacher and myself went back to New York and went to the Met at noon between two rehearsals of whatever he was doing at the time. And Jim bounded towards us. He was so enthusiastic, he really wanted to be involved in another Fantasia. I said, look, let me, let me just start with a hard question first. What do you think of a three-minute version of Beethoven's Fifth? And he sat there, looked at me for about five seconds, he looked at the ceiling for about five more, and he looked back and he said, the right three minutes would be beautiful. To get somebody like James Levine, is like getting Stokowski at the time. They are both full of the possibilities of what you can do with sound. He is demonstrated with his work in opera, in uh, classical music, that he's a man of great vision, great flexibility, and great passion. It came from out of the blue, and I was so delighted, I, uh, I said yes immediately. Funny enough, I didn't feel daunted by how famous the film was. Fantasia was one of those uh, miracles that made me as a as a child feel very at home with music and with all the things in my own imagination about the music which were only uh, even more opened up by that imagery. We recorded all the music in Chicago with the Chicago Symphony at the Medina Temple because this is an especially 
wonderful recording venue. It's one of those rooms which, although it might be not ideal for the human ear to go to concerts there, the microphone just loves it. The microphone interacts with it the way the human ear interacts with a great concert hall. I was very impressed with the orchestra, which after all spans several generations, was as committed to the idea of recording for a continuation of Fantasia as I was, which only means the original Fantasia made a very strong impression, not just on my generation, but across a great many years. To produce Fantasia Continued, Roy Disney enlisted veteran film producer Donald W. Ernst. As Disney and Ernst proceeded with the film's development, word spread quickly through Walt Disney Feature Animation. Many of the artists on the Disney staff had pursued animation careers because of Fantasia. I don't think I know an artist here, for going back to the beginning, that won't tell you that he was in some way influenced by Fantasia. And probably, at some point in his life, if he doesn't have one now, had an idea for a number that he'd love to do. So, you know, there's this kind of collective will there to do it. When you look at the artists who've come together for this movie, you see such a range. When we first conceived a film, as a whole, our, our, the concept was that each of the pieces would have a different style, a different feel, uh, a different way of animating in each of the pieces. The pieces are individual expressions of usually individual artists. They are very personal statements of what they want to express to the music. And we've selected directors and said basically to a director, here's a piece of music, what is your vision for this piece of music? Let's put this vision on film and let the directors go with that idea. People often ask, where does the music come from? Whose idea is it? Why this piece of music or that piece of music in Fantasia? And again, several different sources come together. One of them is this extraordinary book we have of notes. It's the actual carbon of typed original notes of dialogue between Walt Disney and Stokowski. And it was during the making of Fantasia and following Fantasia. What ideas did they have for the future? And we, of course, flipped through that and found some ideas of music, or at least talked about music, coming out of that. And we listened to all of those and then came up with pieces that we liked also. The criteria was we had to like the piece of music and also a piece of music that we thought was something that we could tell a story with we would narrow it down to three or four choices for certain things and then run it by James and say, what do you like the best of these three or four? And he would give us his opinion. And then in many cases, Roy Disney came in. I would say if you look at the probably, the, probably more than half of it were really pieces of music that Roy felt something strong about. I decided that probably the safest way to go at it was to try to find a beginning and an ending that in some way paralleled the abstract Bach, Toccata, and Fugue in the beginning of the original one, and at the end, that sort of mixture of the sacred and the profane that was Night on Bald Mountain and the Ave Maria. Probably the most famous four notes in music. Da 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 da. Everybody on God's earth, I think, at least in the Western world, knows those four notes. And we picked it precisely for that reason. It was one that we felt was familiar to our audience and then one that we could, uh, that would create a response immediately. And that's basically the reason it's, it comes first in the film, because we want to get our audience's attention right away, get the audience to focus on the screen right away. And it lends itself to my, the notion that I had always had, that I wanted to do an abstract very handmade looking and rather short piece for the opening that was about sort of rhythm and color and emotion is expressed through color and maybe a little story that you could get out of it. I knew by 1991, 92, that the computer was going to be doing tremendous amounts of things for us. Let's not kid ourselves about that, but I don't want it to look that way. I want it to look like somebody, there's brush strokes and everything, and somebody made this lovingly by hand all alone in their basement somewhere. The, the interesting thing about doing any of these pieces is that there has to be some emotional chain in it that emotionally carries you along in some way or another. 
What Pichot Hunt did with Beethoven's Fifth comes directly out of him. It's his execution of what he feels about that music. Pichot had found a way to bring the emotion into abstraction in a way that, that generally the audience is understood, I think, quite well. A lot of people think now that at Disney, everything we do is automated or, you know, just press a button and the computer does everything. All the backgrounds were done by hand. All the layouts were done by hand. Our personality animation was done traditionally and used as a guide for our CGI department. We did have some traditional character animators uh, on some of the personality scenes animate those by hand. And then we took those rough drawings and we, we scanned them into our computer system and we went in and match moved our 3D model uh, to some of that. And there were other scenes where we just created a flock of these shapes flying around. It really blurred the boundaries between effects animation and, uh, and character animation. So it's a collaboration of the old and the new technology. <laughs> To take the most arresting, exciting symphonic opening that was ever composed and use it means that every kid who has never heard this before, every person who comes to this fresh will, I hope, have to rush out and go to a record store and get involved in the whole length and breadth of this music. I took my great-grandnephew to see it. Later, I said to him, what did you like best? And he said, the first one. And I said, the Beethoven? He said, yes. I said, what did you like best about the Beethoven? He said, it was all of my Crayola crayons. He has the 64 box. I think that Pines of Rome goes clear back to a music appreciation course I took in college, but I know I've known the piece of music for a long, long, long time. It's a piece of music that sort of brought, to me, brought an enormous amount of emotion and some sort of a story content with it. And it's why I carried it with me to our very first meeting under my arm. I said, here's one of the pieces of music that I think we ought to be thinking about for finding a way to interpret. And uh, so it, it got there day one. <laughs> when I first listened to Pines Around, the first spark of idea that came to me was it, it felt like the music just took off, it just soared. It happens like fireworks, it just explodes and you're just off, you know, somewhere flying. And I had a couple of story artists working with me at that time, and uh, I, I said to them that this gives us a sense of flight. Let's find something that has to do with flight in it. People sitting around listening to the music and doodling. Uh, somebody drew, started drawing pictures of cloud shapes. And everybody sees things in clouds, of course. And one of the clouds was shaped like a whale. And so Handel said, gee, wouldn't it be nice to have whales flying? Wouldn't it be a different kind of thing? That placed you up in the, the frozen north and, and uh, sort of added to the the sort of fanciful realism of it, you know, sort of the aurora is always kind of God's plaything to me, you know, He's a, let's draw with crayons in the sky. And so it, it kind of kept the notion, this, this interesting combination of reality and fantasy together in a, in a nice kind of way. Pines is a very, very emotional piece. It's very interesting because you don't realize how emotional it is until you see it all put together and you see all the animation and how the animation works with the music. There are things in all of the best Disney films that are ineffable. Can't put them into words. Can't talk about them. You can remember what you felt. You don't know exactly why. What you feel is what that segment does to you. And only the best film does that. The Pines of Rome was, was exciting to me because this was a really original idea. I mean, talk about a piece in which clearly the music was composed by a man who 
had a very strong, specific idea. It turns out that uh, Respighi had in mind the Roman legions, but <laughs> oh well, you know, we didn't, we heard whales, so. This is the great thing about animation and about pines is that we were able to just imagine it and hear the imagination that the artist had in their mind is now a reality up on screen. People often say to me, why flying whales? A better question would be, why not flying whales? Eric Goldberg had dreamed for over 15 years of making a piece based on this music, this very piece. So what you're seeing is Eric's passion, Eric's dream on the screen, every frame of it supervised by him. Quite different from an animated feature. When Eric directed Pocahontas, that's a very collaborative thing. When Eric does Rhapsody in Blue, that's a personal thing. He'd always wanted to do it. Uh, he'd known Al Hirschfeld for a long time. He loved his style. He brought a lot of Hirschfeld to the genie way back in 92 or so. At the end of Aladdin, we had asked Al Hirschfeld if he would be interested in uh, doing Rhapsody in Blue as an animation project. And I said, well, I haven't thought about it, but I said, I'm an old friend of George Gershwin's, and uh, I, I loved Rhapsody in Blue, and I said, it, it might make a, a very enchanting shark film. And at the time, he said, that uh, you know, he felt like he couldn't design a whole slew of characters for it, but that he would be uh, happy to have us adapt his work. So years pass, and he keeps talking about it, we keep talking about it. Finally, during a production hiatus at Walt Disney Feature Animation, Rhapsody in Blue was green-lighted as a special short subject, independent of Fantasia. The Goldbergs enthusiastically set their storyboard drawings to the Gershwin music. And I was invited to a screening of it and sat down in the back row and watched it through. Uh, Eric's storyboards are almost like Eric's animation. Sometimes you, you wonder if he isn't already finished with the show when he, when he films the storyboards. And uh, I remember when the lights went on, I said, Eric was sitting right in front of me and I said, Eric, this belongs in Fantasia. I got a call from Mr. Goldberg. He said, we're going ahead with the fantasy, with the uh, Rhapsody in Blue. I couldn't believe it. We, uh, we wanted an American composer, which we didn't have. We wanted, for lots of reasons, we wanted to have Gershwin in the, in the film. The thing that the film seemed to be missing was a, yet another kind of animation with another kind of music. And I was very tickled that it happened to be animation that had been done because of an inspiration from a major American work like Rhapsody in Blue. It's a real collaboration between the music, the color, and the, the designs, and, the, and Hirschfeld's drawings, and Hirschfeld's 30s, and Gershwin's 30s, and, and, you know, and just the whole entire feeling of it. And this collaboration seems to work. I mean, that's the way I think animated films should go, in pure line, to communicate to the viewer what the artist intended, and stay away from taxidermy, and try to anatomically reproduce the human figure because in that way lies madness, I think. The whole idea of the animated movement of line, it seems to me, is a liberating thing. It expresses the emotional intent of the artist. The communication of line through uh, animation that these animators have done with, under the direction of Mr. Goldberg, it's uh, fantastic, really. I, I think it's a creative thing in itself. The collaboration existed from his uh, understanding what uh, my drawings were all about. It was a labor of love completely to, uh, to do the piece. You know, I had grown up, you know, seeing the TV guide covers and seeing all the, the Broadway drawings in the New York Times Arts and Leisure section. And one thing that really is nice about Hirschfeld's work in particular is that it's timeless. What happened with the Steadfast Tin Soldier was this odd confluence of events. The first one is that Walt Disney had wanted to make a compilation movie of the stories of Hans Christian Andersen. And several of the Disney artists did a whole pastel series about different Hans Christian Andersen stories. Back in the 30s, uh, there was an artist named Bianca Majoli uh, who was asked to create sketches for this very piece. 
and they wanted to put it in with a whole nother movie about Hans Christian Andersen. So that idea was sitting in our animation research library. Then Roy Disney comes in and says, I would like to do a piece based on the Shostakovich Piano Concerto Number no. 2, known to us as the bouncy, bouncy music, because he would play this music and his daughter would bounce on his knee when she was a tiny, tiny little girl. Roy Disney came in with the music of the Shostakovich piece, the Piano Concerto, and he just said, I don't know if there's anything here, but just listen to it. He had been listening to the music and idly leafing through a book of illustrations for a little fairy tale called The Steadfast Tin Soldier, which had been made at Disney as a potential short fairy tale, and they'd done some storyboards on it. They found, dug the storyboards up out of the morgue and printed them as a little book, in which Handel had. And he just sat down by himself one day and put them together, and it was a miracle. The structure fit so perfectly with, with the music that I began to get really excited about it. Handel called me about three days later and said, come over and look at this. We all looked at it and said, oh, well, <laughs> score one for the good guys, you know, that, that was too easy. The Tin Soldier piece has sort of a book illustration style to it, which is very beautiful. And, uh, and we were able to lay in these computer-generated characters, uh, and they're blended very well. And because they're toys, it was a great use of the technology. It's hard to remember now in the year 2000, but we were, we were making those little toy soldiers before there was a Toy Story. The marriage of 3D characters on traditional painted backgrounds works beautifully. I was amazed to see it in color all put together. It looks wonderful, luscious, deep, rich colors, and it really does feel like it belongs in the movie. It has a classical, almost timeless feel that we were all trying to get. The interesting decision I thought that was made pretty early was to stick with hand-painted backgrounds and, and operate the CGI characters in front of conventional hand-painted backgrounds. It really made a big difference, I think, because it really brought the little toys out here in the foreground as real objects operating against a kind of a fairy tale hand painted background. The story had to be absolutely perfectly told and emotional, so that it didn't matter whether we made it on a computer or not. And something about the rhythmical rigor of this piece found its way also into the animation, so that the animation has a, a rhythmical vitality and a, and a line, an arc, which is thrilling. But it's completely based on the story that Anderson told, as interpreted by Disney artists, as reinterpreted by us, put with the music that Roy brought in. It was extraordinary, with this harmonic convergence, if you will, of idea, music, and artist all together. Carnival of the Animals came to me from Joe Grant, who worked on the original Fantasia back in 1937, 38, 39, helping to pick the music. And Joe had loved the ostriches in Dance of the Hours and thought they ought to be continuing characters, I think. So when we first started on this project, Joe called me and he said, I have the piece of music and the idea for you. And the piece of music was the finale to Carnival of the Animals, which is a little short two and a half minute piece. And he said, my idea is, what if one of those ostriches from Dance of the Hours got hold of a yo-yo? That was it. And uh, that is exactly what it turned out to be. And the only thing we did was we changed the ostriches to flamingos. And part of that was because the ostriches were kind of, seemed kind of familiar from the other show. And partly because flamingos are so much more colorful that they seem more fun. The idea was that it would be a tour de force for one animator. Eric Goldberg directed the piece, did a fabulous job. It's lots of fun and, you know, and uh, the idea of what happens when you give a yo-yo to a group of flamingos is, is a great idea. He just wants to play and have a good time and the others want him to get in line and do the same thing that they do every day. So it's kind of a conflict of personalities. That's one thing that's really nice about a marriage of animation and music in general is that it's so universal for everybody when it works well. You know, everybody gets it and gets something out of it. That's one thing that's really nice about the whole Fantasia format in general is, is that it's international. You can, you can do 
anything with it and, and people will understand it. It's a silly idea and it's witty and it's whimsical and it's charming. And that's an extraordinary contrast to some of the more serious pieces. So I was very deliberately trying to find something that was just fun for its own sake. And, and that's what this is for sure. There's no other message hidden in it. <laughs> When I first started on this project, part of the way to get the ball rolling was to say that, well, we're, we're going to keep half the original movie and just make a new other half. We'll make three or four new numbers and put that together that way. And, and it was really clear pretty early in the process that wasn't going to work. But I did actually keep three of the original numbers for quite a while, Sources Apprentice, Nutcracker, and Dance of the Hours. And they were interspersed as we sort of went along and pieced the thing together. They were in there for a long time. Finally, Dance of the Hours, we dropped it out. But Nutcracker and Sorcerer's Apprentice stayed in there for quite a long time. Finally took Nutcracker out and we replaced it with Rhapsody in Blue. So that, there was good old Sorcerer's Apprentice still sitting there. I guess it's appropriate that the one segment from Fantasia that everybody knows everybody recognizes and everybody loves is the one that really brought the film into being. There's something nice about that. It's really the ultimate Mickey Mouse piece. It's the iconic Mickey Mouse piece, the one everyone responds to. And it's really interesting when you play that piece to a new audience of young people and all those brooms start to come to life at the end, you can hear across the audience all the kids going, uh-oh, it is the cutest thing I have ever, because they don't know that story. They've never seen it, but they recognize something in themselves about getting in trouble with your parents, that it is absolutely universal. Sources Apprentice, of course, was the genesis of the original Fantasia. It was made and I guess actually finished before most of the rest of the pieces were even started. And it's probably the best remembered piece of, of the original as well. But it really, it's such an icon of Fantasia in general. And deeper than that, the idea of Fantasia is a celebration of the art of animation. I wouldn't have had the art to dig it out, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Pomp and Circumstance came to me over the phone one day from Michael Eisner's car. Michael Eisner had been to a graduation and thought that Pomp and Circumstance was something that everybody was familiar with and that it might be a great piece of music for Fantasia. And Michael said, it is such a universal piece of music in the sense that, that we're all so familiar with it being connected with something happy in our lives that we kind of tend to remember it. And one of our associations, unfortunately, is abstract, which is that this is a processional which is used a certain way. Fortunately, there's more to, to the Elgar composition broadly than just that one famous march that we always hear. Over and over again, we kept trying to figure out what is the story of the march? Is it babies? Is it graduation? What is that story? And it went through tremendous change, many artists contributing to what the march was until we came up with Noah's Ark. One of the ideas I came up with was that it'd be fun to do a Noah's Ark story from the point of view of that Noah must have had a really hard time to get all those animals on the ark. You know, he must have had to catch them and then drag them and push and shove. And, and it was just such an idea laden with comic possibilities. And we looked at each other and said, why not, can't, how about, there's a march there, my animals march onto the ark, the animals march back off, maybe in between, and there was a flood in between. Maybe, you know, that makes some sense. Um, Donald got into it because there was some notion of Donald being able to help Noah. But the key to it really was that Daisy needed to be in there too. And we said, how do we do that? And the, the team rose to the challenge and, and put Daisy in it. And then in one of the screenings, Michael suggested kind of a, like a sleepless in Seattle, that they keep missing each other. And uh, it, was, it amazed me, actually, when we, when we finally finished it and we'd run it for audiences and they'd, they'd see Donald and Daisy reunited at the end and they'd all go, oh. And, and you know, you kind of realized that you really had created an emotion between these two characters that was, that was very touching. When we were recording Pomp and Circumstance, I kept 
trying to find ways to keep the sound animated because it's not as inherent in that piece as in some of the others. In that piece, there's a kind of a progression, but as we talked about how to develop the animation ideas for that piece, it affected the, the vitality of the performance a great deal. Uh, well, I'm glad Elgar's not around <laughs> to uh, tell us whether he's happy or not. Uh, I have, of course, a long history of fooling around with other people's music. Uh, uh, but I, I, what I do feel very strongly is that in a dramatic thing like this, uh, the only thing that matters in the final analysis is how it works. There were enormous notes on virtually the whole classic repertoire that were made in the, in the research for the original Fantasia. Almost everything that we wound up doing had had at least a cursory glance in the late 30s. Firebird was one of the pieces that we discovered had been licensed to us <laughs> by uh, Stravinsky himself at the same time as Rites of Spring. Firebird didn't really come into our consciousness until we tried a half a dozen other pieces looking for a finale that had some kind of an uplifting nature to it. I said from the beginning, it has to be the emotional equivalent of Night on Bald Mountain in Ave Maria. And I remembered having gone for a drive up in the north part of the country with my wife one year right after uh, Mount St. Helens had gone off. And we went right by it in this huge flow of ash and the river clogged up and the trees all down and everything. And I said, wouldn't it be neat to set up a time-lapse camera that just overlooked this whole thing and leave it there for the next 500 years and watch the earth rebuild itself, you know? And, and somehow that notion came back into my mind as we were talking about this thing. And Paul and Gaetan Brizzi, I think, came available to work on it about that time too. And their concept of birth and regeneration, or chaos and rebirth, sort of fit into a naturalistic viewpoint on it. The forces of destruction are part of nature, you know. And probably we, we may have to say that sometimes you need big destruction for a beautiful rebirth, you know. And that idea of birth, death, and renewal, I think it's a powerful message. It taps into what Paul and Gaetan wanted to say, again, this is purely from them. They storyboarded it, they designed it, they supervised every frame of it, and it's so beautiful. They were going to tell in the Firebird the highest theme of the best Disney films. And let's put it together with the best musical take on that theme. That's all we want to do, fellas. Just what Walt said, better, always better, always better. And out of that, a lot of people have said to me, what are all those people talking in between the numbers about? And I've said, well, the first reason they're there is because they were always there in the original movie. In the original Fantasia, Deems Taylor stood out as a host and introduced each of the pieces. But of course, at that time, he was very famous in America. He was a radio host and a professor. Everyone knew him. But what we had to do was something fresh. I think you have to have interstitials, number one, uh, in some way or another, because it's a little bit like the sorbet between courses at a dinner. You need to cleanse your emotional palate a little bit. There needs to be some kind of a pause for your emotions to sort of stop and restart. The second reason is it's an informative thing. It's what is this next composition coming up? It's a little like you're at a concert. And third, I thought that with the right host, that we could give the audience a little taste of, of how to relax and enjoy it. Okay, Jim, he's on his way. Go to the intro. We recruited Don Hahn, who is uh, uh, to direct the live action sequences, who is the producer of uh, 
The Lion King and several other films here. When um, Roy Disney and Tom Schumacher and Donners came to me and said, would you be interested in directing these sequences, I actually leapt at the chance. We want to again be a little reminiscent of the original Fantasia, which took place, the interstitial material took place in, within the orchestra, so that you were in effect at a concert. So we still want to be at a concert, but, but we don't want it to be quite so literal as the, the original. But I thought, you know, I really want to give a sense of all the people that it takes to put on this show, and it's more than just the orchestra, although they're a huge part of it. It's also an army of artists and singers and technicians. One of the first ideas that came to Don, uh, which he brought to us, was we need some sort of place, geographic place for this to be. And with the, the number of things that you can do with computer graphics these days, we knew that we could take the orchestra and put it anywhere we wanted. And somewhere out in outer space seemed like a good idea. So Don went off and, and designed this sort of set. I guess you can call it a set. It's an orchestra out in a, a sort of a limbo space somewhere. So on stage in front of the camera, here's the band, here's the the artists, here's the chorus, and you see all that before the downbeat of the first note of Beethoven's Fifth, and you get a sense that, oh boy, we're in store for something. I think what you see is a fresh look at the music, you see a fresh look at the hosts, and they give you, I think, inventive ways to get in. They're really magical introductions. You know, we needed something that was uh, kind of elegant, but didn't take away from the segments themselves. At the end of the day, though, it's about the art of animation and the music coming together. Um, and if anything, people will go to the theater to enjoy those two things, and uh, that's what Fantasia is about. Although Fantasia Continued was initiated in 1991, the development and creation of the film spanned nearly a decade. Finally, a release date was chosen, and along with it, a new title, Fantasia 2000. As the theatrical release of Fantasia 2000 approached, the tradition of Disney showmanship was much in evidence. Today when we do Fantasia, we're going to push the edge again in terms of technology. Not only in the way the movie is made, but the soundtrack, the digital recording of the music, but also in the IMAX presentation in terms of really going in some place that no feature film has ever gone before. One of the most sensational viewing experiences available to film audiences today is the IMAX process. It uses 65 millimeter negative, which on a 70 millimeter print is run sideways in a projector. Now, to give you an idea of it, your 35 millimeter standard theater uh, print is uh, four perforations high. The 70 millimeter five perf image in a first run 70 millimeter show is about twice as much information. The IMAX takes the 70 millimeter, turns it on its side, and then uses 15 perforations to present you an image the size of a large transparency. It's tremendous fidelity and clarity and depth. And Fantasia 2000 is the first time animation has ever been presented in this amazingly eye-popping format. The idea of going out on IMAX is a big idea. It's big for two reasons. One, the screen is big, but two, it's experimental. When Walt first released the movie, it went into special theaters installed with Fantasound. It was like nothing else you'd seen before. That's not unlike what we're doing with IMAX, going into another experimental range. It was indescribable fun for me to see the film when it was finished because they had really taken the trouble to make an IMAX negative so that the huge screen would appear absolutely sharp and the soundtrack is played back in the theater, very live, but not hopped up like something where you wish you had earplugs. I mean, it's, it's strong, but it's natural sounding. Fantasound gave you that, and the IMAX presentation gives you that. Well, when you go to see Fantasia 2000 in IMAX, it's like seeing the biggest mural on Earth, but it's moving. I think Fantasia 2000, it, it, it creates an emotional response to, in each of the segments, and I think the emotional response is different in each segment. And the emotional response is much more important than both the visual and, or the oral response. That is why this medium that Walt Disney got involved in has done what it's done. And you see the stories that they're telling in each of these segments. It's the story about 
us surviving, going toward what we think is the good and the true and the beautiful and making the best choices that we can make to get there. One thing is for certain that Fantasia has demonstrated for 60 years now that there is something that seems to speak to everyone, to adults, to children from all cultures. I think it's interesting when you look at this film because it is a gift. It's a gift to the audience and it's a gift to the art of animation. This is an opportunity for even today when animation is a very commercial, very successful medium, that we can be reminded that it is also pure artistry. Fantasia is about exploring ideas within the art form of animation. So it's almost a laboratory for ideas. A laboratory is not a commercial venture most of the time, but with the Disney imprint, it becomes something quite different. So for the Disney company to sponsor the idea of Fantasia as a basis of experiment, as a forum for creative ideas, some of them may soar to the sky, some of them may be amusing and, and light and entertaining, and some of them may not work as well as others. But if they're willing to make that commitment and say, this ought to be done, there ought to be a place for this to happen, that's significant. And that gift to the audience to come in and see the art of animation explored in such a wide range, I think that's extraordinary. And that's really why Roy wanted to make this movie. Roy has really been the champion of this movie from day one, as he's been the champion of animation for the last 15 to 20 years. This film was very personal to him, and in fairness, I don't quite know why. Something about this movie touches him very deeply. He's put his own creativity on the line, his artistic instincts on the line. He's frankly put his soul on the line with the music that touches him, the stories that touch him, and artists that are interesting to him. And so when you see this movie, you're really seeing something that came out of Roy, Roy's passion. And completely, I must tell you, without Roy Disney, there would be no Fantasia 2000. Mm-hmm.